right, uh, I'm Ethan Gruber from the American Numismatic Society, and I'm going to be talking about linked open, de linked open data methodologies applied to uh, integrating numismatic library, archival, and museum materials together into one cohesive uh, framework. So, um, is anything showing up here? Strange, that slide doesn't seem to work, it doesn't matter that much. Okay, so anyway, those of you who were there, here this morning saw Karsten and David's um, discussion on Namisma.org specifically. And Namisma is a linked open data thesaurus and um, framework that allows us to aggregate uh, numismatic materials from museum collections, archaeological databases, uh, databases of typologies and hordes and that sort of thing. Um, and so we have URIs that define typologies and URIs that define uh, coins, physical specimens in museum or archaeological databases, and URIs for hordes. And I'm not going to talk too much about this uh, today because it's already been uh, discussed this morning. But basically the driver behind uh, these systems is Namisma. And this allows us to display on the left you see typological information about a particular coin of Alexander the Great. On the right is a map and timeline showing the ge geotemporal uh, distribution of that typology over time and space. Um, and that's driven by Sparkle. That allows us to aggregate coins from various collections connected to that URI of that typology um, and show them to the user and harvest um, measurement data and geographic data for analyses. Um, but the American Numismatic Society is more than just um, a very large collection of coins. We're also a research institute. We have a library. We have the largest um, numismatic library in the world. Uh, we're a membership organization with an archive. Um, the archive contains information about the society and its membership, but as a research institution, our, archival, um, our archives contain uh, research materials, uh, manuscripts um, written by uh, scholars, research notebooks, um, archaeological photographs, um, all sorts of things that you'd commonly find in any sort of archive. And so one of the goals of mine over the last year has been to integrate these lar uh, large um, archive and library holdings into the system so that we can actually provide a greater historical context to, um, to our more numismatic data-driven projects. So if there's a coin mentioned specifically in a research notebook and somebody's viewing that coin in our database, they can click on a link and actually view the page in a notebook where some scholar in the 1930s um, wrote about that coin. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the sort of uh, archival and library holdings that we uh, that we possess. Um, one of the starting points is the archival authority system. Archival authorities are basically people, um, families, and corporate bodies associated with an archive. Um, in this case, um, we have two numismatists who are active in the early to mid 20th century. Uh, they're contemporaries, uh, they were colleagues. Uh, they both were members or administrators in the American Numismatic Society, but also scholars of Greek coinage. And so they collaborated with each other and they wrote letters to each other. And these authorities um, we define with URIs as well. And um, since they had relationships as colleagues, we can um, use RDF and triples to, um, to encode these relationships to drive social network visualizations. So if you went to the URI for Edward Newell, who was a Greek uh, scholar, a uh, scholar of Greek numismatists, numismatics, um, you'll see some biographical information about him. You'll see a map and timeline of events in his life. Um, there is a, uh, a social network graph that you can explore, which um, is driven by, oops, driven by his um, um, relationships that are encoded here. 
And all of this information is encoded in an XML format called EAC CPF, which is called is um, encoded archival context for corporate bodies, persons, and families. And this is an emerging standard uh, within the archival community for capturing authority information, which is uh, name authorities, um, authorized headings for names, um, and some basic biographical information. And um, moving beyond this, um, we have other materials within the archive. So we have finding aids, and finding aids are um, basically a large index of materials within an archival collection. Uh, so we have the papers of Edward Newell, and these papers are located in boxes, and within the boxes are folders, and within the folders are individual manuscripts. So a finding aid is a tool for a, a researcher interested in this person um, to read in what box or folder that particular item that person is looking for uh, is located. And so these are on the web as well in digital form, and the standard for this is encoded archival description, which is another um, common standard within the archival community. Uh, next we have uh, photographs, archival photographs, um, archaeological photographs, that sort of thing. These are um, um, digitized and the metadata standard is MODS, which is something else from the library community. Uh, we have research notebooks which have been scanned and um, represented by TEI documents. The TEI is a markup standard for text. So we have a collection of scanned images and uh, developed a system based on a JavaScript um, library called Anatorius, which was developed by Reiner Simon, who's done a lot of work on Pelagius. And our archivist basically uh, annotated um, different lines in these notebooks, which link to external resources, either coins in our collection or other databases, um, hoards that have been published in our hoard databases, uh, typologies, references to books that have been published and that sort of thing. So um, we're putting the, the URIs directly into our TEI documents through this annotation system. Um, did you want to take a picture? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the next thing I'll talk about um, are our uh, library holdings. And um, we have a large library, but we're also an academic publisher. And over the last hundred and some years, we've published more than 500 monographs. And we publish one of the uh, most reputable uh, journals of numismatics. Um, recently, um, well, within the few, last few years, most of our books which have been held in uh, academic libraries have been scanned as part of the Google Book Scanning Project. Um, of course, anything published before 1927 or so has been public domain anyway. Um, and all those scans have gone to a, a consortium of academic libraries called Hattie Trust for long-term maintenance. Now, a few months ago, we wrote a long letter to Hattie Trust explaining to them that although our 1927 books are public dom domain and freely available, we'd also like to attach a Creative Commons license and make uh, all 500 books openly available to the public for free. So they acquiesced to our demands and therefore made all of our other books uh, published on Hattie Trust open. So uh, around that same time, uh, the NEH, the National Endowment for the Humanities and Mellon Foundation announced a joint grant program to um, allow people to, uh, academic publishers to uh, get some funds to publish open access books in digital form. So we got money from Mellon, and uh, we took these PDFs from Hattie Trust. We sent them to a vendor in India to be uh, transcribed into TEI. So we're, we've received almost all of these TEI documents back for about 80 books. And we're beginning to add value uh, to the markup, uh, tagging uh, coins in our collection, uh, coin types in our databases. Basically, anything with a URI that we can mark up in these books are, are being marked up to add value to these books so that they're not just a, a book on the web that you can read in an HTML page or download as an EPUB file to read on an e-reader. You can click on links and you can see more information about the things that you're reading about in these books. So I think it's really the, the next generation of academic publishing 
um, that I think we're going to see in the next 10 years or so. So this is a little bit of TEI. I don't really want to kill anybody with XML markup in a, in a presentation, but there's some TEI here. You can see uh, there's a URI for a coin hoard that we've published, and this section is about that coin hoard. Um, there are some other TEI tags that uh, link to other elements within the TEI document, which are URIs for uh, people defined on the MISMA.org. So we have archival materials and library materials that we can link to our archival authorities. Uh, we have URIs representing all of these things. And so to speak about the architecture a little bit, we have archival stuff and EAD mods and TEI on one end, uh, exported into RDF uh, and open annotation in DC terms and other ontologies. We have uh, library holdings and mods and TEI on the other side, all being exported into RDF and open annotation. And then our EAC CPF authority records are also uh, being exported into RDF following the bio ontology and other uh, ontologies into a Sparkle endpoint, which um, allows us to extend our various um, software frameworks to interact with that endpoint in order to display information um, from some other framework in, in the one that you're interacting with presently. So if you're looking at the, the authority record for Edward Newell, you can see a list of archival materials or books written about him that we have in our, in our holdings. Uh, similarly, um, our coin-driven uh, projects like our uh, collection and our coin, coin hoard databases can draw from this archival endpoint in order to display information. Um, similarly, um, while we're linking internally all of these systems, we're also linking externally. So through Namisma, uh, we have a concordance uh, between places in Namisma.org and places in Pleiades. So this allows us to export our um, archival holdings into Pelagios to make them more broadly accessible to people who are interested in the ancient world in general. And um, the uh, Social Network and Archival Context Project is a major uh, multi-million dollar project funded by Mellon to create a, a really large scale international archival authority system. And there is a lot of overlap between our, um, the people in our archives and people in these larger archives. Um, so that would pave the way for our materials being made broadly available to people um, researching um, you know, anyone else in our archives, um, which is interesting because we have um, materials by J.P. Morgan, who was a, a wealthy financier during the Industrial Revolution. And most people who might be interested in the Industrial Revolution um, may not go directly to our archives to do research. In fact, they probably wouldn't. They wouldn't know that we have holdings at all, but this uh, allows our materials to be made more broadly accessible. And uh, we also have, um, well, our annotations for our first published ebook are already available in Pelagius, so Reiner was uh, very kind to, uh, to import those. And this is just a screenshot of the snack project. So, how much time do I have, Leif? Okay, I'll do a live demo. I made a, a, a backup, just, just in case the internet didn't work very well here. So, okay, so what you see here is a, a record for Edward Newell. So if I scroll down, um, there's biographical information here, social network graph, and you can see related resources that are within our, um, within our holdings. So if I click on, uh, what's a good one? This is a good one. Click on one of these notebooks. Um, it will take me to the notebook in our, in our archive. Um, still loading. Well, anyway, there should be images for the notebook. I don't know why it's not showing up. Um, but you can click on one of these links that will take you to another URI someplace. So we can go from this notebook to um, 
to a hoard in our hoard database. And so we can navigate from the notebook to a hoard database. So there's um, information about this hoard, IGCH 158. There's a map showing geographic distribution. Then on this hoard page, it will also show you um, the uh, particular page that this shows up in. Um, so that's, you know, that's part of uh, what we have here. Um, if I go to numisma.org slash if I go to numisma.org, I can view the page for Alexander the Great. It also show me associated coin types for Alexander. Um, and I can click on one of these. Um, it may take me to uh, a different site um, entirely to the Berlin collection. But um, you can also go uh, to um, some coins in our own collection that have been annotated on these particular pages. So we have a, a silver dram that uh, takes us to a coin in our collection. And this coin in particular um, is linked to in a uh, the Pella database with a particular typology number. We can click on the link to go to that page in Pella. Uh, we can scroll down and then there's also the mention of, of this particular notebook um, where this coin was annotated within our uh, museum collection database. If you want to see the particular page, you can click on the particular page and it will take you there. So this is a way of just basically traversing uh, using the graph of data and linked data to tra traverse from one um, one platform to another through archival and museum collections uh, seamlessly. So that's uh, basically it for my presentation. So are there any, any questions? Thank you.